I'm delighted to be here. I'm really very grateful to Debbie for all the work she does in setting this up. And I've seen some of it just now. It's a major project to get this all coordinated and going. And of course, I'm grateful to uh, Bill for inviting me to do the series. I enjoyed doing it a lot last year. It made me do a little bit more studies on economics than I've done for many, many, many years. So that was helpful. And I also enjoyed doing the Peace Prize, which uh, I will do again this year, uh, the week after next. Next week, Bill is back doing medicine and uh, I know you'll all tune in for that because he's that's his specialty of specialties and it's an exciting prize this year. So without further ado, let us begin. Now do I stuck. do I do back? I can do it here, maybe. Yeah. So, uh, we may have a few glitches as we go along. Uh, these are not the Nobel Prize winners this year. They, in fact, are the winners from last year. And I wanted to show them, partly because it shows the contrast between their prize and the prize this year, and also because we see them when they get the prize, but we don't see them when they receive it. So this is uh, Michael Kremner, uh, Ajit Bannerly, Banerjee, and Esther Duclos. Uh, Esther and uh, Ajit are married. They were all at MIT when they got the Nobel Prize. And it was very significant in that essentially what they did was run clinical trials with random selected uh, uh, groups so that they were able to zero on on things that really worked in the third world. So they found the best way to do agriculture in villages. They found a, a very good way by doing the control group against a random sampling, the best way to do um, injections and to get people to come for vaccines. So it was a very helpful uh, thing they did. And here they are receiving the Nobel Prize. Uh, that's uh, Dr. Banerjee receiving it. And now, without further ado, we'll do the 2020 Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences. And the Nobel Prize in Economics has only been running since 1965, I believe. It's the newest one. It works a little differently, but we don't have to get into that today. Uh, the prize winners in this case are quite different. They're both, though, Americans. They're from Stanford. And the chap on the right is Robert Wilson. He's in his 80s. And the chap on the left is uh, Paul Milgram. And Paul is in his 70s. The point being that Paul was, that, that uh, Robert was the mentor of Paul, and they spent their whole career together. So whatever did they do? What is the prize in? Well, the prize is in auctions, quite different than the other one. So that's two different types of auctions. And as you can see, they vary a lot. And in fact, the theory behind auctions also varies a lot and is quite controversial. So. That there are different kinds of auctions. There's the English, which they don't do in coffee auctions. There's the English in which the highest bidder wins. So it's the one we're most common, uh, familiar with, and it's the one they were using here. You start low and you work up to a high price. And then there's the Dutch, where you start high and work down. So someone is raffling a car, they might say, let's start at 50,000 and no bids, no bids, and they keep cutting it down until it was sold finally at, say, 20,000. And then there is the Vickray auction, which uh, this is an English and Dutch auction used in that context. Uh, 
And in that context, and in the Vicary, which we'll get to, there is something called the winner's curse. And one of the theories behind auctions is they're constantly trying to find out how the winner's curse can be lowered. And of course, the winner's curse, we all know, is they pay, you pay too much. So uh, one, this is a few points in the theory behind them, that people who go to auctions are optimists which means they tend to overbid, so they're subject to the winner's curse. The, their highest estimate is always larger than the value of the thing they're bidding on. So if you're bidding on, say, a chest of drawers and you really want it in your bedroom, uh, you may say, I've got to have it, I'm ready to pay $2,000 for it. As it turns out, the auction price which is being established as bids go along, is much lower, but you get so involved and nervous that you're not going to get it, you bid the higher price. So they found that with auctions. They also know that if there are more bidders in an auction, the higher the price goes, although there is a limit to that. After 12 people, 12 bidders, uh, it slopes off. It doesn't go off, out, off quite as quickly. And usually a bidder knows less than the other people bidding know about the price. So that the cumulative, uh, cumulative group is actually better at setting the value. So we can now look at Vicre. Vicre uh, was the name of a Nobel Prize winner. I think he won, won in 65. And his, the idea was to try to reduce this winner's curse. Um, so it, it's a little hard to understand, but the way it works is that the highest bidder pays the price that the second highest bidder bid. Now, one way to explain this is, and it isn't clear, it's in that fuzzy area. To me, it is in any case, but and it's very important for the theory, but less so practically, and I'll tell you why. It, it's the way eBay is based, so that you see the prices going up, and you come to a certain price that's where you want to buy it, you're ready to act. So you put a very small increment on and you win it. So yours is the highest bid, but it's not much higher than the second highest bid, which is the price you actually pay. I know that may not be perfectly clear. Now, Vicre came up with this, and it has pertinence for what we'll be looking at later on for the, pri the people that won the Nobel Prize. And that is, they used his system in New Zealand in 1965 to auction uh, television licenses, bandwidth for televisions. And the highest bidder was $100 million, which was great. Everybody was very happy. It was a Vicre auction. He only had to pay the second highest. The second highest bid was $11, $11 million. So. That was not a very good idea. And as I say, it's more based on theory. But to iron out particularly that problem, the problem of selling spectrum, which is the frequencies that we use for cell phones and televisions. And that was the challenge faced by these Nobel Prize winners. So they, they used something called combina uh, combinational auctions. And we see them here. They're when there is more than one thing in a package that you want to buy. So you would have it, for example, at an estate sale where you want to buy the chair over here and you'd like to combine it with the lamp. So you want to bid on the package, not the individual things. So that's uh, one application of uh, a combinational lot. The other is truck, truck lots. It presents the problem of finding out if you have a whole bunch of packages to be picked up and they have to be delivered to different destinations to find the optimum truck route and package loading, you use uh, this economics, combina combinational economics. <clears throat> they also, excuse me, they use it for bus routes. This, if you can believe it, is the bus routes for Toronto. So the deal was you have a limited number of buses, a lot of different routes. The buses are in different places at different times, and you've got to get them all 
in the right place at the right time on the right route, and it's an economic problem uh, of allocation. Now, a very special case, and that is TV and cell phone frequencies. And these are auctions that I think we're familiar with, and the rest of the presentation really is on this. And it's a very complicated problem, as it turns out, we, because, um, uh, because someone who is bidding wants a package, but suppose uh, the package often involves two or three, let's say just two different places. Suppose you want Toronto, but you also want North Bay. And they're not in the same package. They're, you can't just bid on them individually because you might get Toronto and not North, North Bay, but your company only works if it's got the two. So that's why this is such a special case. Now, it's only recent, and particularly uh, thanks to Wilson and uh, Milgrove, that they didn't use the old way. And the way governments uh, used to sell uh, frequencies, these the frequencies that you need to run television stations or more recently cell phones, was they ran a beauty contest. So here we have a beauty contest. The idea was you simply lobbied the government as much as you could, dealt with them directly, and they awarded you the prize, they war, war, awarded you the frequency. But they never got a good price. And the governments, in fact, got very poor prices when they were using the beauty, beauty contest. So to solve this problem, there were a, a bit of an evolution. But what really finally solved it was the Nobel Prize winning combinational, two-sided, simultaneous, incentivized auction. And believe me, it's as complicated as it sounds. There are relatively, I'm going to try to explain it to you, at least as, to the extent that I understand it. There are only a few people in the world who actually know enough about it to be really effective in bidding. So. Going back to what we had, this is the old, uh, some of you will recognize the old test pattern on CBC. At one point, television stations had all the frequencies. There were no cell phones, there was nothing. They had all the frequencies. And cell phones had to fit between the frequencies for the TV. So it would be like a radio station, I suppose. You have a station on 800 and you have one at 85, and the cell phone runs in between. That's probably not exactly what it is, but that's an analogy. So they were used to selling off these little bits and pieces. But the television companies were using less and less frequency, and the cell phone companies were losing more and more. So they needed to increase the, uh, they wanted to sell off some of the television licenses and have them picked up by the cell phone companies. So what do you suppose this is? Did anyone guess? A cell phone tower, because uh, that's a cell phone tower in Arizona. There's a more conventional one with the new users. Cell phones are now the big users of these frequencies. So here's the situation. We looked at this a little earlier. Uh, it would be a map. Frequencies are shown by the colors. But these would be all chopped up into perhaps 500 different areas. So you might want a little piece at the top and another a big city down here, and you wanted to combine them. So we had to come up with a kind of auction in which you would have the option of buying two quite different pieces of frequency in quite different locations. So Milgram and Wilson came up with something called well, we, we know what it was called, but it's a spectrum auction. A spectrum off auction is where they are auctioning frequencies. So in this particular one, the Milgram, the Nobel Prize winning one, there are two sessions. The first session uh, is a clock round. And essentially, this is, it's difficult to get your mind around, but they set the price 
and you start to bid. And uh, once you, once all the spaces are allocated, there have been bids on everything, the auction is finished. But it's not an easy process. And to give you some idea of how complicated it is, in an auction that ran in the States not too long ago, took a year. In other words, there was constant bidding for a full year, every day. Uh, the people running it would be in rooms, hotel rooms or corporations around the place, and they would, they would keep bidding. And they all apparently, or the, the uh, folklore is that they ate red licorice. And they took these. Does anyone know what these are? Their tongues. So this was a high stress activity. And it's, I'll try to give you some example. Suppose you wanted Toronto and North Bay, and you're willing to pay $3 million for Toronto, and that's the one you want. You want those. But the auction, from the auction point of view, is, and these are done to maximize the return to the government, incidentally. It's good, that's the good news for us. Uh, and they, didn't, they don't get into that New Zealand situation any longer. So uh, you're, you, you have not one you really want, but as all these others come up, and in Canada there's 180 of them, or in the States 500 of these little groups, uh, you keep changing how you're going to allocate your money depending on what you can get. And it keeps going until everything is sold. So it's important. Every bid you make is important. That is another thing to keep in mind. Because in the supplementary round, the clock auction is done, which means all the spaces, the 500 spaces in the case of states, have been allocated. And they go into the supplemental round in which, well, we'll come to that. We should go back here. They come to the supplemental round where the auctioneer looks at all of the uh, frequency areas that have been sold, and it's easier if you think of them where the, the various television stations were, perhaps, and then looks at the map, looks at the bids, all those bids that were made over, say, 10 months, and decides what the optimum sale price is for the government. So that takes them a couple of months, and they finally come out with a decision. Now, this was the result of a March 2016 spectrum auction in the States for 700 microhertz bands. And it brought in, well, the cell phone companies paid $20 billion for it. So this is big stuff. TV made $10 billion. The government made $7 billion. And hedge funds made 700 million. Now, where did the hedge funds come from? This should just be between television sales fund and the government. Well, just before Milgram's scheme went to bid, a, an academic at Harvard, a woman, realized there was a flaw in the auction. That, in fact, it only would really work with uh, all these permutations and combinations if there was only one television station in each of those markets. In fact, the hedge funds, knowing that this was coming up, had bought a whole lot of TV stations around the country and hoping that they could make money on them. So they went into it agreeing that they would drop some of the ones that they weren't bidding on and keep the ones they had. Because, so what happened in the end was uh, they received from that cell phone money $700 million. Was it a good investment for the stations that they had bought? And these would be sort of broken down TV stations, or small TV stations in outgrowing out areas that weren't really valuable. They spent $74 million for the stations, and they got a $700 million return, 10 times what they paid. So that was another little thing in economic...
So we also did do them in Canada. This is the result of one that was done in August uh, 2015. It only had 173 different possibilities, little groups that you could buy and put together. And uh, this is how it, it came out. Uh, Rogers paid 3.3 billion. Telus paid 1.43 billion. Bell, uh, a little more than half a billion. And Videotron in Quebec, uh, 233 million. And the government made 5.3 billion. Now, the thing to remember is the New Zealand one, and Canada would have been in the same situation. It might have made uh, 100 million if we did well on the using the beauty contest uh, idea, uh, whereas this vastly increased government revenues. Not everybody uses, but there's about 10 countries in the States that now use this system to allocate their uh, frequencies. So that's this, essentially the core of the presentation. Uh, this is the winners. Uh, this is Wilson and, uh, and Milgram. And that's what they look like in person. I've always wondered why the Nobel Prize people don't get better uh, draw people to do the portraits of the people they have. They always look hideous. Uh, so that's them today. And you can see a few of their charts and numbers on the back behind them. So, no, they're going to go down one more. So before we go to the next slide, uh, the question of uh, that people going into auctions often ask is, well, which, which method works best? What, what should I do? So these are a few of the things that they recommend these days. If you're doing an auction, you should set a minimum bid so that uh, they've got to come in at a certain level so you at least get something for your... Uh, for the bidding. An ascending English auction is the best, works the best. And you should let the people bidding know as much as you can about the value. Because the more they know, uh, the more likely they're, they will, you'll get what you need for it and they'll avoid the winner's curse. So that's a bit of kindness. And uh, you shouldn't tell them too much about the competition. It doesn't help if they know there's a lot of uh, a lot of competition. They won't. They've done a lot of studies. They won't necessarily bid anymore. So you don't have to tell them anything about much about the competition. Um, that essentially is what I have to say about it. You may have some some questions uh, given. Uh, given the complexity of it. And let me say that in economics, auction economics, the, the school of auction economics, and it's quite dynamic because billions of dollars is, is exchanged based on auctions. Oil and gas is sold that way and so on. So it's significant. But it's all a bit sketchy. It doesn't have really anything, any firm ideas other than you know the highest bidder gets it. And they play around with all kinds of things, but they've never come up with a really definitive possible answer. Although this particular winner is a huge step in certain, certainly in auction. So uh, the auction, incidentally, for the Sotheby's, you may be familiar with it. I believe the painting finally went for 124 million. So quite stunning. Uh, Really, uh, I'm sure you have questions. You can uh, certainly research it. Uh, and you might aspire, if you truly get all the permutations and combinations, 
because some of the things I didn't mention in the uh, spectrum auctions for the frequencies, there are a whole lot of specialty rules that control when you bid, how much you bid based on your previous bid, and don't forget you're bidding on 500 things over a year. So, but it would be a worthwhile career if you have a child that is ambitious, likes math and this sort of thing, to become one of these people who truly understand spectrum auctions because you'll be in big demand by government, by private enterprise, and have a great future. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. It was fun doing it this way. And uh, if you have any questions, please uh, email Debbie and I will try to answer them.